in life, you choose if you want to be you. And when you, at the moment you choose that, that path, you are on a path of freedom. So on today's episode, you're going to be hearing from the founder of a good for you CPG chocolate brand called Midday Squares. It's a great episode. You don't want to miss it. Do stay tuned. Welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast, where today we're thrilled to have a special guest, Jake Cowles, the co-founder and face of the fast-growing CPG confectionery brand, Midday Squares. Together with his sister, Leslie Cowles, and his brother-in-law, Nick Saltarelli, they've shared their entrepreneurial journey with the world through TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube, giving customers a unique behind the scenes look at building a business. Midday Squares is on track to hit $17 million in sales by May, 2023, more than double their previous year. And their mission is to be a modern chocolate company with functional ingredients that challenge and disrupt the $140 billion chocolate industry. In this episode, we'll delve into Jake's journey of overcoming low grades, past business failures and rejections to build in a successful brand who we'll share how they aim to build a community of fans, how they've leveraged storytelling on social media to drive growth and how their mindset has played a critical role in their success from starting to be an actuary to starting a fitness business and finally founding midday squares. Jake's story is a testament to his courage and commitment to building an authentic challenger brand. So, Sit back, relax, and get ready to be inspired by Jake's story and the powerful lessons he's learned through the way. Join us as we uncover insights from this multi-million dollar brand playbook of Midday Squares and explore the mindset that drives success in the e-commerce industry. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Oh, it's, it's my, I don't know what day this is going to be posted, but it's Monday morning, early here in Canada, East Coast time. And I sprained my back last week playing outdoor ice hockey, so I am in deep pain. That being said, I'm fired up for our conversation, and I know it's going to be fun because we're getting we're getting into the good, the bad, the ugly, baby. Absolutely, absolutely. I wish you a speedy recovery with with your back. What, what happened with, with with the hockey incident? So, do you have you ever played ice hockey? No, just failed hockey. <laughs> okay, so I was skating really fast, and um, I was trying to take a wrist shot. And when you take a wrist shot, you flex your stick because you're putting so much weight and power into it. So the motion, the forward motion of momentum was going, and then I tripped. And I tried subconsciously, I guess, your brain tries to protect yourself. So I tried to protect myself from falling straight on the ground. And I put my hands out, and I caught myself, but I extended my back like a U. And then I heard a little crack. And, um, right after that, I continued playing. So I'm like, okay, I can't be injured. There's no way. There's no way. Next day I woke up and it was, uh, it was deadly. And, uh, I went, I went to physio and all that stuff. And yeah, I sprained my lower back. But the problem is, is now it's like, I'm on my way to recovery, but the idea is it's still like a, there's a tweak pain whenever I do like an excess movement. So I'm like just frustrated, you know, and, you know, being a athlete and being someone that's active every day. This is the first time in my life where something has been taken from me that I cannot control. That's that's a and, and how you react into to this circumstance. Yeah, this is a game of psychology right now, and it's like it's been the most difficult game I've experienced in a very long time. And I was just I, before this call, before our before our our interview here, I was on the phone with my fiance. And I just told her, I'm, I'm feeling very depressed right now and I, I'm having trouble and I'm a very positive person. I'm a mm-hmm. very energetic, you know, momentum driven person, but I was just feeling very low and I was feeling low because I was like, when is this going to change? When am I going to get better? And then I went back to the thought of like how dumb it was, how I hurt myself. And it's like, I wish I could take that back, but then it's like, okay, if I go down that path, that's a horrible, mm-hmm. ener- that's a horrible en- in direction. Exactly. So now it's just like, how do I continue moving forward and appreciating small progress? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, It's gratitude. It's down to gratitude to, to, you know, to, to, to find growth. You need gratitude to find growth. Um, I've spoken a lot about, you know, gratitude on my LinkedIn with regards to first thing you do in the morning when you, you know, your journal is just write, you know, a few lines of gratitude and be genuine about it. and, And that's it. That really is it. Jake, you're full of energy. You're full of energy. Who is Jake? Where did this energy come from? You know, um, as a child, I want to to know who you are, your childhood, and and how 
key moments in your childhood actually link up to to who you are today your your founder or co-founder actually your sister of midday squares it's a fast growing cpg brand who is jake who who who's who's jake the child yeah jake the child is still a jake today so i think when i was when i was growing up I, I I didn't do well academically, so I needed to do something to grab people's attention. I needed to be somewhat, you know, I wanted to be excellent. I wanted to be an outlier. I didn't want to be mediocre, and and that's that that that's still today the same thing. But at the time, being an you know in high school when everyone else is propelling forward in terms of academics, including all my friends, I couldn't do well. I, I have a learning disability. I I just am not strong in that stuff. And what I would do. To instead was be the class clown. I would have fun, prank the prank the teacher, the professor, make noise, make, make you know get into trouble, probation, and I thought that that was the hero status because everyone was laughing, everyone wanted to wanted to see more entertainment, more values. I was like the circus, you know. And um, as time went on, grade eleven came, and that's when you graduate to the next level. And where I live, there's something called CJEP, which is grade twelve and thirteen. It's right before you go to university or college. And they call it CJEP. And I'll never, I'll never forget my principal from high school called me in and my parents and they said, Jake might not graduate high school due to his low grades and his performance. And my mom looks at me and she's just disappointed. And I look at myself that day when I went home and I'm like, oh my God, you know, all the class clown and entertainment and popularity that I was getting from that is actually useless because I'm going to move backwards while everyone moves forward. And I'm no longer going to be with all the people I spent my whole five years with in, in, you know, in, in high school. And that was the moment I said, you know what? I'm going to take my academics seriously. I'm going to try to do as, hard, as well as I can to get out of high school and graduate. And I did. And I ended up going to CJIP into business. And I changed my whole perspective on life. And I started to take academia seriously. And I started to do decent. I started to do pretty well. But in that moment, I started to change my course of who I am. And I stopped being authentic to Jake. I started being authentic to the world of what the societal box wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And the pressure from society to do well in school was a big thing to me. So I did well. And then I went to university. And when I studied in university was I wanted to show everybody that I'm no longer the class clown, that I'm a new person because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be like everyone else because I was embarrassed to be at the bottom of the class and no one thought it was cool anymore. So I ended up studying to be an actuary because I thought that that would be a very high paying job. People would be impressed with me because it's a very high, high academic, you know, status. It's it's deep statistics and math. And I studied that in college and university and I struggled. I struggled immensely doing well. I really hated it. I really disliked the experience of the, what I was studying. And I was doing it for my parents. I was doing it for my friends. I was doing it to prove to everybody that I can do it. And that is a huge mistake. So after three years of being in university, I decided to drop out of that program and just end the degree with a financial economics degree because it was easier for me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going home one, one summer. I remember the third summer and I was applying to jobs and investment banking and actuarial jobs. And I couldn't get a job. Every first interview, I'd get rejected and mm -hmm. I would show up being me. The idea was I would actually show up authentically because I started to realize that being this other Jake that everyone else in the world is, you know, in the box, I was failing dramatically. And I, I felt like I was in mental prison. Like I couldn't get out. I was, I had no freedom. So then finally, after getting rejected by all these investment banks in Canada and these, these insurance companies, I watched Shark Tank one night, as cheesy as it sounds. And I saw this guy on screen and he was pitching his dream to these sharks. And he had two mortgages on his house. He had kids. He had all these responsibilities that I did not have. And he looked so free and passionate and excited energetic. And yet I'm sitting on a couch feeling a little bit depressed, feeling embarrassed of who I am and trying to fit into the world. But this guy yet has so much more responsibility, but he seems like he's on fire. And that was the moment I decided, I said, I, I promised myself that no matter what, I need to try whatever this person's doing. And that's when I started my first business. I started a fitness business outdoors, a boot camp. And in Montreal, it's very cold where I live. So in the summer, everyone wants to be outside. I was throwing these massive workout classes, 50 plus people. I ended up having 180 clients, making a ton of money, having the time of my life storytelling via social media because I was showing everyone fun. And I was finally being me again. I was finally being the Jake of the energetic, the non-traditional Jake. And I felt so free. And then I ended up closing that business after two and a half years because I lost passion for the fitness aspect. 
And I launched another business, which was clothing on college campuses, so sweatshirts like I'm wearing right now, but mm -hmm. with a logo and I'd throw parties and I would hype, build this community energy. And I was being myself because I was having so much fun, but I lost $80,000 and went bankrupt on that business after two years. And then finally, I was finally decided maybe I should stop entrepreneurship because I was tired. My ego was a little shot down. And I was kind of going veering back to like, okay, do I do what everyone else does and just get a job and have a family? And, you know, that's all good and everything. There's nothing wrong with that. But my sister, my brother-in-law approached me with this chocolate bar idea. And they said, we want you to be our third partner in this business. It's about to launch. We need you to blow it up. We, you have blown up businesses from a community standpoint, a branding standpoint. You are a genius at that, but your operation skills aren't great. So I was like, chocolate, food, not really interested in that because I was like, you know, this space is so saturated. And I ended up going through a complete mental restructure and saying, what do I want with my life? And what I wanted was to hang out with good people, partner with good people in life and allow myself to be me every day. And that's what this, this new found partnership would allow me to do. So I ended up joining Midday Squares as the third partner. And we launched it a month and a half later with an unbelievable marketing plan and an unbelievable product, a product with great product market fit. But the idea was... I finally realized that in life, you choose if you want to be you. And when you, at the moment you choose that, that path, you are on a path of freedom. Whatever freedom means to you, you're on a path of that freedom. You cannot buy that. You cannot force that. You have to choose that. And that was the journey from my childhood till currently I'm 29 years old today, living in a free life of what I want to do. It doesn't mean it's going to work out financially in terms of success, but I will have done what I really love to do every day. I, sorry, I am doing what I love to do every day. That's incredible. That's an incredible backstory, Jake. There's so much to unpick from there. Um, you guys are doing well. I, I know you're doing well. You know, um, don't know what the margins are, but you're doing really well from a volume transaction volume standpoint. You're in many targets. We're going to get into the you know the 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 your, your ma operational or marketing success thus far, but let's go back to what you just said. Uh, the, the few things I picked up from, 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 from your narrative. First was, you know, when you were not doing well at school, you know, early on, you know, you're five years in high school, when, you know, you were, you're, the, you're the class clown or jester, how did your parents sort of react to your results? Obviously your results were coming to your parents. Were they critical? Were they neutral? Were they accepting? indifferent what, what was the reaction of your parents so the beauty of my parents is i love i love them because they they're very free thinkers on, on on thinking big and doing things and trying things so you know my father is an entrepreneur and my mother has worked with my father um for a very long time and and she's just a great spirit um it, but when i was in high school doing poorly they didn't really care um or pressure me to do better they did want me to um mm -hmm. they did want me to pass um but there was no like, I never felt the pressure of like, you know, you must get 90s or you must do this. I always felt that they were supportive and they knew I was the class clown because that ball of energy was what made me special. It, it, it's what made me who I am. It's what it's what my purpose is today. It's I like to say I liked my purpose is to make people feel something deeply inside, to spread good energy and show the world that you could win uh, whatever you do by being unapologetically yourself. So my parents understood that. That being said, for them, their dream was to have someone in their, in their, in like either me or my siblings do well academically. And not one of us did other than my baby, my brother, who's an entrepreneur today, but he did a little better than me, my, my sister and I, but we didn't, none of us became doctors, which my mom's dream was a doctor or like an accountant or a lawyer because everyone in our community was becoming that. You know, everyone that, you know, all her friends and my dad, my parents' friends, they weren't on, the kids weren't wanting to become entrepreneurs. They weren't wanting to become anything, but a great well-paying job, a doctor, lawyer, or an accountant or an investment banker. Mm -hmm. And that was the pride and proud of the parents for the kids. My mom and dad had three runs that were running around doing very poorly in school, except me and my brother. And, and then with this free spirit, but everyone liked being around us. So they liked having us, you know? So there was this like double-edged sword of the good, the bad and the ugly from it. Like, you know, and I think that I'm lucky to have gone through the experience of not having so much pressure of, of having to do what I didn't really want to do. I created that pressure for myself.
Okay. And, and your, your sibling number, your, your three siblings, right? Yeah. Your sibling, your, what, what number are you? Which I'm the position? third. So I'm the, I'm the youngest. Third. My sister okay. is my business partner. She's uh, the middle and my brother is the oldest and he is a, he has a toy company. He runs a toy company today. Wow. Um, you know, we're all very different though. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So it's, it's just you and your sister, or you, your sister and your brother running mid, mid, midday at, at the minute. Me, my sister, my brother-in-law, her husband. Okay. And a, okay. And a husband. Okay. Fantastic. 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 Right. So when you joined Midway, how had it sort of gone to market at the time or did you help launch it to market? So what happened was my sister was making this chocolate snack, the Midday Square, for many years, two years before actually um, launching as a hobby. She was making it for her husband as an alternative to the junk that he was eating, the chocolate junk that he was eating in the afternoon. So she made him a better for you chocolate bar that had some protein, plant-based ingredients, good fibers, and it sustained his energy throughout the afternoon. So he loved having Mm. it. So when she ended up closing her fashion company and my brother-in-law sold out of his software, his ad tech company, they wanted to work together. They didn't know what it would be, but they wanted to be in the food space because they were both very passionate about it. So they didn't realize they had a product right in front of their face that they were making every day. But when my brother-in-law read a report from one of these large you know, conglomerates here in Canada, it showed that real chocolate, so darker chocolate, so that above 55% cocoa mass was growing tremendously year over year. And that vegan protein, so plant-based proteins were also on a tear. And in that moment, he's, he's a data guy. He realized that, oh my God, my sister was making for the last two years, a baby of these two massive growth categories. So they had this product and they're like, we're going to launch it. We just need to commercialize it. So they reached out to McGill's food science program here at McGill University, very well respected university in Canada. And they worked with them to create the macros that they needed to get to. So six grams of protein per square, four grams of fiber, a good amount of fats and real food ingredients, but still tasting good. So once they had the product market, if the product was there, people loved it. Friends and family loved it. They came to me and they're like, hey, this is a very saturated market. This is an extremely busy market. We don't have budget. We need to launch this business and we need to hit it big, but we need to get creative. And that is what I do best is thinking in disruption format on how to use storytelling and social media to build community, which will then buy the product. And that's what I said to them. I said, hey, there's 30 to 40,000 products in a supermarket. We need to separate ourselves from those 30 to 40,000. We don't have the budget that Hershey's has. We don't have the budget that anyone basically has. We have a startup budget and that's not going to buy us the retail space, but you know, in the refrigerator, it's a limited space. The only way we could do it, I said, is if we tell a story that will create an emotional connection with the consumer, that way, when the consumer goes to a grocery store or a supermarket, they will see the product because they will want to buy it because they feel like they're buying from a friend, a family, or a neighbor because the story is so emotionally connected or involved in their life. This this is incredible. I'm I'm enjoying this. I'm really really enjoying this. And so, how did you start? You know, telling this story. Where did you? How did you make your first steps telling this story to make the emotional connection and eventually build connection? How did you get your first thousand fans? I love it. Fans, fans, is everything. <laughs> build fans, not customers. That's the best piece of advice you could probably give to any mm. CPG brand owner um, or marketing team. Uh, so when we started, I, I'm I'm an extrovert. I, I'm an I'm an actual extrovert, and my partners are introverted. Um, two of them. So. When I pitched this idea at the beginning of a reality show on entrepreneurship, basically showing everything of how we build the business other than the process, the manufacturing, the trade secrets, I said to my partners, I said, hey, if we really want to make noise in this space, this old school business of of grocery or food and beverage, the only way we'll do it is if we take from the best, we take from the entertainment world, Hollywood. And what I meant by that was I looked at all the shows that had the highest TV ratings in North America. And I basically said, let's take the best from those shows, bring them into our storytelling in a raw, unfiltered way. And that will hopefully work because we'll have a product that's tied to it that people can actually physically go buy to support if they like it. Right. So what I said is I said, I looked at the keeping up the Kardashians, the TV series, and it was on fire. The ratings were absolutely outrageous, you know, and I said, the reason why people like this, so I did my research was because. They love drama. They love family drama. They love the idea of it. And that checked, that checked in our box. I said, you know, we're family business. You know, we're partners in business that are family. We have drama. 
That's number one. Then I looked at Shark Tank and I saw that people, the ratings were on fire because people loved the idea of entrepreneurship. They were curious to know more about it, just like they wanted to know more about chefs in like 2005 with like all these programs like Top Chef, Master Chef. You know, people, they were celebritizing chefs. Now entrepreneurship was starting to become celebritized. So I said, what if we take it 10 steps back, 10 steps further by opening the curtain? So showing what legal battles look like, showing what raising money looks like, showing what, you know, going through an acquisition looks like, showing what, you know, hiring, firing. So I'm showing like everything. People will be intrigued, right? And then the third thing was, I was like, look at Elon Musk. His social media following was absolutely on fire. And it still is today. You know, and and people, the reason why is because he doesn't look like a typical executive. He's unapologetic himself. So people either don't like him or they love him. And that type of polarization is powerful because you build really strong fans within the polarization. And for me, I said, we're three whack founders. If we just take the drama from the Kardashians, the the behind the scenes of entrepreneurship from Shark Tank and the unapologeticness and not typical CEO executive from Elon Musk, we'll have a reality show. And that's all we did. So we started filming everything and unfiltered and showed it on Instagram stories and posts. And that slowly started to get attention. Next thing you know, a thousand fans started, you know, buying our product. They wanted to support. And the way they went to support was go buy it in store or go home and tell everybody about our product or our brand, shout about it on social media or both. Okay, there, there, there's a there's a lot to unpick there. I, I like the you know the the analogy of what you extracted from the Kardashians, Elon Musk, and, and and the rest. There's a personal story bit I want to cover, and then there is the execution of the strategy. So it's it's one way saying okay, we want to create drama. How does how how did you execute? So let's go back to the personal brand. Did you? Jake Carls and your co-founders have to sort of recreate your personal brand or did you just turn up the way you normally turn up? You know, so did you engage with like a personal brand expert? Did you make, did you actually put pen to paper and say, this is the Jake Carls the public needs to see. This is how where I'm going to present myself. These are my colors. This is how I'll always look. This is what I will never wear. This is how I'll talk. Did you define your your sense, your your building block, your your DNA, your your public persona, or did you just say, you know what, I'm going to be as authentic as possible? You know, they, they either love me or hate me, Donald Trump style, and, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, and 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 but but look, is again, you say Donald Trump, Elon Musk, like, these these guys have fans, so yeah. you know they have they've built them to have the 50 50 so 50 percent really dislike hate they even use the word hate and then 50 percent are die hard like they'll go to war for you or they'll, they'll do anything so for me mediocrity is actually the worst so if you just have the neutral you're never going to win big donald trump won presidency and elon musk you know bought his dream companies built his dream companies i'm not saying i'm the big i'm fans of either of them but what i'm saying is these people have done something from a standpoint of fandom that is the typical playbook in winning. That is how you win big by building fans, right? Yeah. So for us, you said personal brand. And I, I think it's important to say when we started, none of the three of us had personal brands. So, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I had 500, 600 followers on Instagram. My partners had 200 each, maybe. Wow. It was just friends. Like, it was just like our friends. They all, all my friends knew who I was, the fun, loud guy that, you know, was was a party animal at the time, you know, played sports, all this stuff. But I never really put it out there. That being said, when I did that clothing business on college campuses pre- previous, I was very loud in the business pers- on the business account on social media and it was building, it was growing. I had like 10,000 followers. So I understood how community builds, right? But I just didn't do it personally. I did it for a brand previous. And when I pitched my partners originally on this idea, they were like, no one cares about the three of us. Um, they're like, no one actually cares personally about us. And I actually challenged them. I said, you're wrong. If we just act like a boy band or a girl band, We could build a fan. It's like, I look at the Backstreet Boys and I'm not fans of each one of them. I'm a fan of some of them. And the ones that I am, I'm die hard for. And what we'll do is I will listen to their music, buy their their music, go to their concerts because I like one of them. I'm a big fan. You know, it's the same thing as in the band journey or whatever it is. You could like one individual because they relate to you. 
So when I start to pitch it like that, my partner's like, okay, let's give this a try. We'll give it three months and we'll see if it works. When I start to realize the power of personal branding was not till the second year of our business. So I actually focused on at the first two years is just showing the midday squares brand. So showing how we're building the business and people liked it. They liked the energy. They liked the, the, the atmosphere. People start to slowly become fans of each, you know, different fans. Like my sister, they were inspired by how she is my brother-in-law because of his software and his analytical ways and because of my energy. So we had different mm-hmm. small fans. And then two years, two and a half years in, I realized, shit, what if we built our individual brands that have midday squares part of it but the brand has so much more to see of your individual. And so I started posting what I like. So I work out with no t-shirt on. I dance in offices. I do crazy, crazy wild things. And that slowly start to create this rapid, who is this guy? He's crazy, wild, entertaining. I like him. Oh, and he owns a chocolate company. I could support him by buying his product. And that's where I realized personal brand is so powerful because once you have an audience, you don't need to sell them on anything. They naturally want to support you. So if you just give them value and you actually are authentic to yourself, it will stand out. And that's when I realized that authenticity, boldness, and being unapologetic every day is the fastest way you'll build your personal brand because people relate and feel comfortable when people are being themselves and real. The problem with our world today is that humans have a fear of being themselves. They're worried of loss of aversion, loss of losing whatever they have, loss of ju- fear of judgment, fear of mis- being misunderstood. But once you pass that, 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 that border, that barrier, and you knock that wall down, the ceiling is unlimited. There's no ceiling, it's a sky. Because you are your own superpower. You, by being unapologetic, no one in the world can do that. They can only do them. They cannot copy you. And that's when I realized that when you unlock that, your personal brand can go exponentially as large as it wants to go, as long as you put the time, effort, energy, and momentum into it. You're a wise, you're a wise, wise man. You're a wise, wise man. So just going back again to, and and, and I really you know, really like the, you know, your points on, on authenticity, you know, boldness being yourself. Going back to telling the story of midsummer, you know, cause you, you of, of midday, sorry, midday squares, you, you know, you said you started out, you know, trying to promote midday squares. Did you, were you behind the camera? Did you get a videographer? Did you, when, how did you sort of cover, c- capture these stories? Were they selfies? You know, how, what did you do? Yeah. So at the beginning, we had to film ourselves and it was uncomfortable um, mm-hmm. because we, none of us were really used to that. I was, I had a bit of comfort because of my previous business. So I understood the idea of just naturally posting things. I was comfortable, but my partners were really, really uncomfortable. Like they didn't want to film themselves. They didn't want their personal life on camera. They didn't know how to selfie style themselves. But the moment we realized how much time it was taking for the three of us to take the content, we realized that our first hire had to have been, had to be a a, a, vid, a videographer, a vlogger, because we needed someone to take that off our our minds to have to pull out a camera when we're in an argument or when we're in a therapy session or when we're in a breakdown. So that was the first hire. And that was a very untraditional or unconventional hire as a food company. And it was expensive. I remember it was like $60,000, $70,000 and we didn't have the money, but we got it because we realized that the content was actually driving the awareness you know, the cost per acquisition to be a very lower cost, right? So when we did that, people were shocked. They were like, you guys are crazy. You're out of your mind. Why aren't you hiring a, why aren't you hiring a food scientist or someone to help you with production? And we were just like, this story needs to be told and captured. And Hmm. the amount of time that it's taking the three of us to capture it is killing the business vision and the operations. So that was the first hire. And then now we have an internal media team, you know, with, you know, editors and videographers that are just creators. So our marketing team doesn't have anybody else in it other than creators. And yeah. um, the idea is they're continuously ch- capturing and telling that story and documenting the good, the bad, the ugly of everything. And I mean like everything. So like therapy, like we film our therapy sessions of the three of us when we're in it and it gets heated like to a point where it's uncomfortable to watch, but we have that documentation. So we show it to our consumers because our consumers deserve to know what's going on. Is it that like, 
everything's falling apart. Yeah, maybe things are falling apart, but here's how we're getting through it. Here's our mindset. Here's how we're powering. Or, you know, my brother-in-law, my sister were on the verge of a divorce, you know, a year and a half into this business because of the business. And we showed the therapy of how the three of us were able to get through it and work towards it. And it was very inspiring and relatable to most of the people in the world. And that created a, a, you know, a trust with the consumer that was so powerful that I can't even spend millions of dollars to get that with the customer. So it's like this weird thing that happens when you're authentic and you're genuine and you don't just show the good, but you also show that ugly, uncomfortable side as well. Yeah, which not many people are willing to 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 do, you know. So you're you're uncomfortable. You're in in the state of uncomfortable, you know, sharing everything, you know, the good, bad, ugly, as, as you said, which is which is which is incredible, which is incredible. So your sister Leslie, um, her her partner or her husband, um, Nick, Nick. and and then you, Jake, would this, um, you know, videographer follow you all day, or was it at specific times? So this is interesting. So at the beginning, it would follow us everywhere, you know, every motion that's happened. Now they still do that. So like when I, like we'll go on a trip, we'll, we'll have, the, we'll have our videographers, we'll bring them with us um, or a trade show or conference, wherever we're doing something big. But I think at the moment, what I've noticed, and this is what's going to tie back to personal branding is we're still limited on resources. You know, we're not the biggest company we're growing, but you know, we don't have necessarily all the money to spend on creators. Um, you know, we still have a manufacturing plant. We own our factory. That's costing so much. You know, the mm -hmm. hires that are going towards that are extremely important. But like, for example, now, as my position relates to the company, I'm a rainmaker. I focus on building relationships, building the network, building the brand, hype, energy, momentum, and making sure we have investors, journalists, retail friendships, and making sure those relationships are continuous to, be, to strengthen and growing, Right. So mm -hmm. for me, I'm never really in the office. Um, I'm in it right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm usually not here. I'm traveling the world. And for me, our videographer is not following me around at all. And this is where personal branding becomes really, really, really important to fill the void. My videographers, our videographers here are filming the drama that's happening at the office. So typically this drama is between my, my team here and my sister and my brother-in-law. And I'm actually not really in it because I'm not really associated with that. So where it's important for me to stay relevant and to stay, you know, naturally out there is I need to build my own brand because I'm out there and about, and, and it's not really being told through midday squares. Um, it is at times I'm obviously in, in a lot of the content when I'm here, but because I'm never real, I'm here only 30, 40% of the time, I'm only in 30, 40% of the storytelling, right? Mm. So that does people don't see me that often. That being said, when I go build my own personal, on my Instagram and my LinkedIn, I'm telling Jake's story. I'm choosing the story that is, is my story. And when I share it, it's inspiring, it's comfortable, it's relatable. And Midday Squares is a, is a part of that chapter of my story, but it's not everything. And that's where I'm building this fandom. And then I'm getting a lot of opportunities to continue to tell my story, but I'm responsible for that story. And it takes a lot of fucking work, excuse my language, to tell that story. Every day I have to spend hours on LinkedIn. I have to actually engage. I have to come up with content. I have to create and I could use my content team here, but they're also tasked with a whole other operation of telling a company story. So they can't give me every bit of minute of editing and time. So I got to be creative. And this is where personal branding can carry you forward, even if you're not taking part in the branding necessarily with the company. And that's what's excelled me forward. You know, it's got me onto Forbes magazine, into TV, radio. Um, it's the personal brand mixed with the brand building of my company. Now, where my sister, my brother-in-law are currently is they don't have personal brands as much because they're so focused on ops and the company, but Midday Squares is telling their story. So mm. Midday Squares is elevating their brand and they're elevating with Midday Squares. For me, I'm telling a story outside of Midday Squares, which is elevating mm. me and Midday Squares is carrying me through 30%. Mm -hmm. that, that's super, 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 super interesting. Um so just going back to mid, mid midday squares, um, who tells the story? So you, you said you have a team. Um, how do you how do you craft what to, what, what to to present? Um, I checked your Instagram. For, that's for for midday. It was amazing because you you did a recap of 2022, and it showed, as you said, the good, the bad. The Yogli. It, it it was really really emotionally enthralling to 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 get into what it takes 
to run a company like Midday, you know, and, and what you guys were actually going through, you know, the controversy, the pain, the joys, your wins, everything was shared in, was it like 90 seconds? And I got it immediately. And I felt connected, you know, to the story. Is it is it you that comes up with the narrative or do you just get creators to say, okay, this is the storyboard. Um, can you guys approve it? And let's, let's get it sorted. So, the, yeah, so that's that, that video that you watched on Instagram, mm -hmm. it must have like 40,000 views or 50, 90, or 90,000. I don't know what the number is on Instagram, but on TikTok, that video blew up to 400,000, 350,000 views, right? So we're getting all this organic viewage and like, you know, I think that it's because the storytelling is powerful. That being said, my, my editors and videographers here, they create this, they, so the senior editor here actually guides the story with my sister who's acting, so, acting as a creative director. So she, her and the senior editor guide the story. So they come up with okay. the storyline. My videographer here captures the story that needs to be told. And then they re go back and edit it and tell that story. Now, from a standpoint of how they tell stories every day, it's kind of like a newsroom. So like they'll come into the office, they'll look at everyone's calendar, see if there's any drama or, if, and then they'll be on like, on like call. If there's anything that happens, like, let's say, you know, we had a, a, a big board meeting, they'll come to the board meeting, they'll film it, they know it's there. Or let's say a machine breaks down unexpectedly, the videographer is there to capture all the drama, the the, the solution pr to the, the problem and then interview people at the time. So it's like a newsroom. That being said, it's not like, there'll be like bigger things that they work on, like a storyline that will take maybe a week to two weeks to build. Mm -hmm. That will be in the in the realm of the kids to work on it. But otherwise there's spontaneous things that happen. And, um, that's how we tell the story. And it's a very complex thing. And we're still under-resourced on the team for it. I think we still need one more capturer, one more videographer, and one more editor to actually complete the, you know, the way that we want to brand build even more. But like I said, like, you know, between our social media followings as a company, we have 320,000 on all of our socials, but with millions of views yearly. So like, think about the amount of consumers falling into this, 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 this spiral, this rabbit hole of midday squares where they're like, okay, like this company doesn't rarely, it rarely talks about its chocolate bar. It talks about the emotional story of building a business, the yeah. good, the bad, the ugly of it. So they fall in love with the story first and then they're curious. And then when they go to their grocery store, their local target, let's call it in the United States or their whole foods, they see it and they're like, oh my God, I love this buy. brand. I'm going to buy it. And then they buy it. And they're already biased to want to like the product because they know us, they feel it. And then once they like it, because it's a good product, they then go to their dinner table at night and they shout about it and acquire us more and more customers. So it's like this, this method that I think every company should use. I'm not saying that everyone has to go tell their story of the good, the bad, the ugly. I think that they have to find their authentic story as a brand. But once you have the great storytelling aligned with a great product market fit, you're your limit is exponential. You can go take over the world over time. You just need to be patient. You need to have grit. You need to have conviction. And you need to be able to withstand immense amounts of pressure because that is what entrepreneurship, in my opinion, is all about. It's incredible. Again, do you think, so has all of this really been told via video? Is, is, there, is there any other media type, you know, like static images or GIFs that you think, can still tell your story or um, is it video or nothing for, for you guys? So video is very big for us. It's our dominant factor. Um, mm -hmm. We tell it via static video or stories like continuous day-to-day -day stories. Mm -hmm. um, I think pictures and stuff like that definitely do a good job. We do it. We do it. We describe like a bold picture, for example, like if we had a massive milestone showing you the energy, the momentum in that picture. And I mm -hmm. think it's powerful. Um, I think the second thing is, is on obviously on LinkedIn, it's more written stuff. Mm -hmm. And we have a podcast that's a very, it's it's just the three of us at sitting down at a table talking mm -hmm. about, you know, real life things. And it's a chat that's actually very much growing very fast. We just don't have that much energy and time to put into it. But, you know, we have like 40 episodes and we try to do it once a month. And what's really cool about that podcast is it's really growing, not on the end consumer, it's growing in the industry for CPG. So we're actually getting you know, buyers listening to that. We're getting investors, wow. journalists, people that we need to grow the actual business from a, a structural standpoint is very engaged in that conversation because we basically show our entire playbook on how we're building it. It gets into the mind of how we think, how we act, how we execute. So I think there's like any, any storytelling is not just video, you know, picture. It's, it's everything. It's, it's everything. It could be audio. It could be static. It could be written. It could be, you know, video. It could be, you know, how you, how you tell your story when you're on stage, when you're 
to an audience. That is yeah. storytelling. How you carry yourself every day in a meeting. That is storytelling. Storytelling is everything that you make people feel. It's the emotions. It's the added value you give to you. The storytelling is just the, it's the vehicle to get to that. It's to get to the heart of the, of the individual. If you're not getting to the heart, you will not win. You will not get to the top. I tell you this and I'll mark my words today, whatever in 2023, I'm telling you in January 23, that the future of marketing is not the performance, the influencer work and all this stuff. That, that's great. You still have to do that. The future of marketing is going to come down to who is the best storyteller. That is who's going to win. It's not who has the most money. It's who could tell the best story and get it to the right outlets. Once you have the best story, you're almost guaranteed eventually, if you stay consistent, to hit the virality. And I mean true virality, not the one that's a one hit wonder. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about consistent hundreds of thousands of views, millions of views that people that actually care and want to watch and want to know more. It's interesting. So, so James Clare, you know, um, author of Atomic Habits has said, um, or, you know, his, his framework for, for actually infusing habits is identity. You, know, you, you need to change your identity and identity boils down to the things you do on a day to day basis. So if listeners, CPG brand owners or consumer brand, you know, um, owners listening to this podcast want to change their core identity, both as individuals and for their brand, um, to, to become storytelling brands, to, to even have a chance to thrive in, in the next decade, how would you define, how would they redefine their identity? What daily actions um, should they take um, now that would stick with them lifelong for the entire you know um, life of their brand or or um even their, their own personal lives if, if they they choose to be storytellers here's the best piece of advice share your story and i don't care if it's your business your hobbies your life whatever your story is share that story and, and people might say well i don't have anything interesting to say and yeah. that's completely false and i'll tell you why that's false we as humans are stuck in our own ways we live our story 24 7 every single day every every minute, every second. So we might not find it as interesting ourselves, but that doesn't mean that you aren't living, you aren't living my story 24 seven. You might not even be living it every day. You might be living it only once a month. So you are gonna find it interesting. So start slowly just to share those bits and understand that no one's living your story. So it's something new to them. It, they're curious, you know, people wanna know. And storytelling doesn't go viral right away. Mm -hmm. It's brick by brick, it's small progress every single day that can lead to forward momentum. And once you are in that forward momentum loop or, or, or energy, it's almost unstoppable if you keep it in the forward direction. Mm -hmm. And it could be even sharing a thing that says, hey, everybody, good morning. I feel good today. Once you start letting this out and getting comfortable with those things, you're going to lose the fear. The fear eventually, the muscle that's blocking you, or the, the sorry, the, the wall that's block, blocking you, you will eventually build the muscle so strong that you could just knock that down. And once you knock that down, the world's your oyster. You could say anything you want. And again, it bring it back to Elon Musk. He says whatever he wants. Yeah. And it drives millions, tens of millions of views because he does it whatever he wants. He does get in trouble. But at the end of the day, he doesn't care. He's accepted that it's okay. And between you and I, the world has rules. But the world's rules that I believe in are solely to be kind to people and to not do criminal activity. Everything else is freedom of play. If you want to say anything you want in the world, do it. Because the the end of the day, the world is, it's all a fugazi, fugazi, whatever you want to call yeah. it. It's all fake, man. I, I, and I say this with optimism. And the reason why is, Everyone's playing a part. It's theatrics. It's it, it, it. No one necessarily knows everything what to do. We're all in the game together. So yeah. when I realize the moment I start to be a little bit more bold every day, say things a little bit more funky, a little bit more weird, a little bit more true to myself, I start to get more fans, start to get more right. people inspired, more fired up, start to get more trolls. But that's when you unlock the true freedom of your story. And then you start to get addicted to telling your story and you need to be just be very careful that you don't get addicted to the viewage and the stats because yeah. that is a so that's what's called social media addiction. Mm -hmm. And that's just the same addiction as cocaine or, or casinos or gambling or whatever. So I just think that if I'm giving a piece of advice to everyone, start getting comfortable with a little bit of discomfort of telling your story and don't do it so big. Do it small pieces every day. 
It's like working out. You don't have to do 100 push-ups a day. Don't force yourself to do 100. Do one. See where it goes from there. I promise you by the day 20, day 50, day 100, you're going to be doing way more than one a day. Yeah. Jake, when it comes to storytelling, who, who, who do you look up to? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Okay. And all the right. reason being, I look up to all, and I, okay, here's where it is. And it doesn't mean I stand right. with all their views, but I look up to all the controversial figures and I look up to them in the sense of, I study them. I study every political leader out from Democrat to Republican, conservative to liberal, um, from extreme to extreme. And from, you know, people like Jeff Bezos to Elon Musk to, you know, everyone in the book. And I'll tell you why, because they all share their stories in a different way. And I'm curious to know how the fandom builds and the study of the fandom is applied to everything from your personal relationships in your life to the way you grow your business or the way that you tell your story, right? So when you study these individuals and I watch all their, I watch videos, I watch how they present themselves at conferences, how they present themselves on TV, how they write their posts, how they engage in their speeches. And I take the commonalities from it. And when I do that, I start to develop the best from them. And I put it into me, my authentic self. And then I start to study that and I start to train my muscle to get better and better at it. And that's how you become a way better storyteller, a way better performer, a way better person in this world. That being said, it doesn't happen overnight. This takes years. I've been swinging and missing in entrepreneurship for 10 years by now. It's been 10 years. That's, that is still not, I am still not successful, but mm -hmm. I have learned, I have grown individually. I have personally become a better storyteller. I've become a better leader. I've become a better human. But again, this is, this is years of work, time, energy, sacrifice into it, studying those leaders that I'm telling you, I'm getting my information from reading books, books, allow you to have mentors that you don't even need to get to know as a person. They mm -hmm. tell you their mind in a whole book. It's like having a conversation with them, asking them questions that you, you get to ask. And on top of that, the third thing is, is also surround yourself with people in your life that inspire you. And I, I know it sounds cheesy, but those people are going to elevate you to become better. Yeah. Yeah. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Really, really off field question. Um, what's your take on YouTube? I see you guys are not too active on YouTube. Um, a short way is short form the way to go. The TikTok you, you mentioned, um, 350,000 views and from a single post on TikTok is Instagram rails, you know, YouTube shorter is, is short form the, the way to go. I definitely think short forms right now, just from the attention span is the way to go. YouTube, I believe is our future, actually, believe it or not. I believe down the line, and I'm talking like more like five, seven years, um, mm -hmm. we are going to do longer format on YouTube and have mini docu-series going. Um, we're just not, we don't have the resources right now to handle that. But if I tell you the TikTok, I'm going to go look at my phone right now, just to give you um, uh, the viewage of our last 10 videos that we've posted yeah. on TikTok. Okay. So I'm looking right now, you can see I'm on it. Um, we have 180,000 followers, but here, hmm. so last video, it was one, 1 million, then 313,000, then 425,000, <laughs> then 3.8 million, 165,000, 282,000, 751,000, 8.1 million, 10 million, 2, 217,000, 129,000. That's the last 10 videos. That is over 30 million organic, non-paid for Insane. views. Insane. Think yeah. about that. Think about that. If I were to put it on primetime TV, it doesn't even get that. Yeah. And this is our choice of story that we're telling. Yeah. So it's like, here's the deal. Figure out how to tell a story that works. But I tell you these views, by the way, now in the last 10, 20 videos, and it's doing well, right? But here's the thing. When we started on TikTok a year ago, we had 10 views per post, 50 views per post. And we had a big following on Instagram previous. It wasn't hitting, but we stayed authentic to our strategy. We didn't change it. We stayed true to good, great storytelling. And at first, after eight months of trying this, I was like, guys, it's not working. TikTok seems to not like the type of storytelling. And then finally it just hit. And when it hit, we realized that, wow, like this is working and our strategy is being rewarded. That being said, we just kept small tweaks that we would learn along the way, but we didn't change because of pressure, because we were watching people do like these funky dances that were getting 20 million views. That doesn't keep community. What keeps community is adding value to a consumer's life, adding emotional value, added value in education, entertainment, 
consistently, not just a one-time hit. And that's why I always say people, everything's a long game. And if you're playing the short game, you're really on the wrong track of life. Interesting. Speaking of edutainment, you know, education and, and entertainment, which is bang on that's the way social media actually works, is your in your creator team, your editor, are they comedic? Do they have entertainment in their in their background? How do they I mean there's some um there, there's some captions on your on your Instagram reels that just says we're we're just robbed, you know, and on all of that stuff. So what's a background? How do you hire a creator that you know will tell your story from an, an edutainment standpoint. So our vid- our capturer ha- has traveled the world, lived in many countries, and he's experienced a tremendous amount of culture. So he's told those stories which are very interesting to us. So we really enjoy that about him. His name's Trevor. He's a very, 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 very big legend in our company. And then our senior editor, James, um, he's been with us for a while. He actually, he used to ta- edit vlogs on YouTube, I believe. Um, I think that's what he did before. And he's a gamer and like he is obsessed with learning. He's an individual that continuously to be obsessed and 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 gets focused on getting better at what he does. He has such conviction like an athlete does. Um, so that has has brought him a long way from his original storytelling that he's done with us. He has learned the TikTok algorithm, he has learned how to tell stories, he has done research on every type of storytelling that's been out there. And that's what you need when you have a creator. When you're hiring, find someone. That doesn't have to be perfect at the beginning, but they have to have the basic skills, but they also have to be obsessed with getting better and learning. Like an athlete, when you're competing to play in the NHL and hockey or NBA or football or whatever, soccer, whatever you want to call it, they need to be obsessed with getting better. They need to, yeah. they need to love the art of what they're doing and continuously improve it. For me, I used to not be obsessed with entrepreneurship. Now I've learned to become obsessed with it because I've learned to be obsessed with learning. Every day I read a book, like I read 30 to 45 minutes, not because I have to, not because I need to, but because I'm, I want to learn more. I want to actually become, I, I've, I've never learned in university. I didn't learn in college or high school. I'm only learning now and I'm choosing what I'm learning. If I want to learn about innovation, I can learn about innovation. I want to learn a new language, I can learn a new language. But I've realized that my my growth as an entrepreneur didn't come from didn't come from me banging my head on 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 making chocolate what it came from was a experiences being put in certain scenarios and having to deal with those scenarios and then meeting people but the second thing is is opening my mind to wanting to learn every day i'm not saying something new every day but i'm saying something learn something be open minded and that helps and i also i see therapy and i think i think this is uh, something that no, not too many people talk about, but me and my partners go to a therapist once a week, minimum together to work on our communication, to understand each other, to have hard conversations. And mm-hmm. that has kept us together as a partnership, extremely strong over the last five years and has grown us. And I think that therapy is the most, you know, is the most, de- most, most powerful tool anyone can use if you allow it to be part of your life and embrace it and not avoid it. And I used to think I was the happiest guy, man. And, and that was all wrong. And now I'm working on myself and it's, it's been a tremendous journey and I hope to do therapy for the rest of my life, next hundred years. Mm. And, and, and I want to do it two to three times a week. Obviously it's very expensive, but yeah. it allow it's your, it allows you to play with your mind, understand your mind, understand how you can improve that, the, how it works, the mechanics, the rewiring. These are like things we don't even learn in academia uh, as growing up. So it's like, this is where my mind's going in the next 10 years. And that's mm. where I want to go. So Jake, how did you pick your, your therapist? Did you have to kiss several frogs to, to find the, the princess? No, I, I was lucky. Um, and I, I, and I mean it, um, what, with luck, I, my partners was see my partners were seeing this therapist, James, Dr. James Gavin previous for 10 years. Um, so it, I was just transitioned into it. And the deal was when I joined the company as the third partner in August, 2018, before launching the brand. The fact that my we, my partners made two agreements. The first one was that we were going to film everything and actually be give it a three month runway to document. Like that was my pitch to them. They they had to accept even being introverted to get on camera. So they accepted that. And then they asked me, the only way to join is if you come to therapy once a week minimum in good or bad times with us. And I was like, I don't need I like therapy. That. I'm like, I'm too good for this. And I was not. I was naive. I was narcissistic, and uh, I ended up doing it because I wanted to join the company. And I did it for the first five sessions. I hated every moment. I thought it was stupid. And then after that, I've become the largest advocate advocate for it because it has made me a better person. I have I have learned so much, and 
I've realized so much about myself that I didn't even know beforehand. Mm. And um, so I'm lucky to have a, this therapist, Dr. James Gavin, who is available to us when we call him whenever we need. And we, like I said, we spend $50,000 a year on therapy as a company. Um, and eventually we want to have it as an internal team uh, therapy where they can all, our whole team can utilize hopefully that service um, down the line, but we're not there yet. You know, at the start of this conversation, you're talking about thoughts, the power of thoughts. And, you know, it's our thoughts that actually lead to emotions. And, um, you know, that mental health foundation, it's it's just fundamental. It, it is absolutely fundamental to, to, to being our optimal selves, both for ourselves and for for our partners. You're in a partnership, right? You're, you're in a family, you know, literally, and a business family. And you have investors, you know, and you, you have customers, um, just showing up to be your most authentic and um, essentially better person, you know, through through therapy is, is important. I, I agree with you. Okay. I want to talk, just touch base on, finally touch base on um, really on on your personal brand, just because we've been talking about midday for for, for, for a while and then we'll, we'll get into, you know, some of your amazing successes. I've, I've been tracking some of your successes on, on LinkedIn, you know, just following you on LinkedIn has been insightful, just the, the color um, and the, your activity and your milestones, you know, you're in CBS, you're, you're in, um, you were in, in Forbes, you're, 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 I saw you on, on your Instagram with Walmart, you're just launching Walmart and it's a celebration. You're, you're celebrating all those wins. So from a personal brand, um, separating yourselves, yourself from, from Nick and Leslie, um, what do you think, what, what's been, been your biggest learning building your personal brand? Um, and, what first principles do you think um, would you now say, okay, this, 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 these, and this is what you must do to, to start this personal brand journey. Um, you know, like, 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 like what you've done yeah, I, from your brand. I, I think that, thank you for, thank you for the comments, you know, but also before, from, before we get into that success stuff, it's like, you know, with that success, there's, there's extreme pain. There's extreme pain and failure in this company. We have failed and we have lost so much money. Um, there's a lot of things that have gone wrong and still go wrong every day. Um, but from a learning standpoint, on the personal branding, the, the biggest learning I can give to anybody, and it's one sentence, is there are no rules and lose that. No one cares. No one actually cares after 24 hours. So I think that like, you know, don't be afraid. Like the judgment is not like, you are your own biggest critic. critic. And like the moment you realize that, it's like un move yourself out of the way and let it out. Let your story, you have so much to say. Everyone has so much to say. We experience so much things in the world. You have so much beautiful things to share, so many hardships to share, so many moments. Just because you share something doesn't mean you're going to get fired from your job. Doesn't mean that your colleagues are going to shit talk you. And if they do, who cares? Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? So that's what I try to tell people with their personal journey. And yes, I'm in a place of an entrepreneur and, I'm, and I own my own company. So I have no, the consequences are my own that I accept. That being said, I'm not saying to go share crazy shit that I'm sharing. I'm saying to share journeys of your life that are, that are, that are, that are, that are, that are inspiring, that are, that, that cannot hurt anyone. There's no, there's no pain from it. There's no harm. There's no hate. It's just love. There's no private information. So like, go, go out there and just share, try something and don't look at the views. Don't look at the likes. Don't look at the comments. Just be proud that you shared it and then try again and then try again. I don't care if it's one word that says, let's have a good day or or something like, I just got promoted in my job. Don't be embarrassed of your successes. Don't be embarrassed that someone's going to make fun of you. And they will. People will. And the only reason why people make fun of you, just to remember this, is because it's a them problem, not a you problem. I deal with internet trolls all the time. They put me down. They see me in articles. And they're like, this guy is blah, 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 blah. And I read the stuff and I'm laughing because I'm like, I actually feel bad for the person. I don't, I don't dislike this person. I feel bad that they're suffering because what they're suffering from is an insecurity that either you're doing something that they really want to do that they're not doing, or mm -hmm. they have to justify that they haven't done something like that. So they have to put you down. And the way that you have to handle these people is be there for them, be there with them, try to get them out of that phase work, mm -hmm. you know, show them kindness, but also show them like you're a human too. And, yeah. and, and feelings do get hurt or stuff like that. So like bring them to the human because we all are equal. Every single person in this world is equal. Um, I'm no better than anybody. And I don't believe anyone else is better than me. 
Um, and once you start to realize that it's life is just a game of just chess. It's like do what you want, you know, and, and the, the rules are the rules you make other than obviously my two rules are be kind. Like I said earlier, every day lead with an open heart. And the second thing is yep. do not do a criminal activity. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. So just scrolling through your Instagram, that's midday's Instagram. I feel you're trying to evoke a feeling, a good feeling, you know? So when I take that chunk of, of midday squares, I, I will feel good. And that connects with all of the other content. It, it is really, really positive on there. Now, you guys on your website, you know, you're a, you, you, you claim it, you say it all out that we're the first functional chocolate bar. Now there is an epidemic of sugar, you know, in in the aisles of supermarkets and and, and all. You're fighting something. Why why are you not being vocal about that fight? And why have you chosen to go down the route of this emotive feel good through midday squares, despite you? actually being highly, highly nutritious. I mean, the, the function on here is, is is superb. I will buy midday. The moment it becomes available in the UK, I will buy it over and over again because it's just a healthy alternative to the crap that's out there that we shouldn't be eating on a daily basis, but some of us do because they're very addictive and it is what it is. Yeah, the, we, we created a product that was low sugar, real food ingredients, plant-based, protein fiber, and to make your afternoon better. The goal was, can we give you an indulgence that's clean and, and, and better for you and that also sustains your energy and keeps you full? And we felt that no one was doing that. So that's why we created this product. And it's working because people are having this dark chocolate bar at 2 p.m. and getting their enjoyment, their treat that they've wanted but also not getting bloated, not feeling shitty, not being tired and not being hungry. And we avoid that crash that everyone has. And that's why our products has the product market fit that we I discussed earlier yeah. is because we want to become part of your lifestyle every day. We don't want to be dessert for you. We want to be your everyday afternoon snack. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And it's, it's not using refined sugars. We don't use that stuff. We use foods that I believe will be around forever um, and real foods that you know, we could digest in our systems. And, you know, this is the whole idea is we like to say we're a modern day Hershey's. And I only say Hershey's not because, not because of the products that they create. I mean, in terms of size, we want to be a new version of that. Like we want to yeah. be the better for you, real chocolate bars, real foods and relatable company that is yeah. culturally relevant. That's not like them, unfortunately, but the size of what they are in the next 20 years, that's what we want to do. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason I'm saying this is that other brands would say oh, we're keto. They they latch onto or oh, low sugar. They will latch onto certain terms, but you know what you guys are doing on here is like you know follow us along our journey. We're building this chocolate company. We're plant based, functional squares with the best chocolates, and and every other thing down there never really lays claim to the fact that you're you know you're you're keto friendly. Those technical terms, it just you know, just, it's just, it's just fun. It, it's, it's mainstream. It's not targeting a, you know, keto diets obviously are, you know, a, a fraction of the population. You're not re you're, you're really saying, you know, everybody can be happy. We're happy. This is our journey. These are ups, you know, downs of our company and we taste bloody good, you know? Yeah. Yeah, dude, we're, we're, we're just here to make real food products that taste good and um, give you an alternative that is better for you at an affordable price and uh, we really want to be around for the next 100 years as a staple in people's homes. So I hope yeah. that we could do that. And uh, yeah, food should be um, not harming you. It should be helping you. Yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, so let's talk about your milestones. Um, in 30 days, you guys um, sold, Midday Square sold over 115,000 you know, bars. You and since 2008, when you launched, you know your 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 um, condo kitchen had the capacity of making 80, um, 80, 80, 80 squares a, a day, and now you've hit the ninety thousand capacity in in your in, in your facilities. What does operations look like? What what does it look like behind the scenes now at this scale? And and you seem to be growing over and over. You're in Target, you're in Walmart, you're in Whole Foods. 
Um, so, so how how does it feel churning this out from an operational standpoint? I know you're not in you know you're not involved in the operational day to day. Yeah. So for us, our whole vision is to get to a 60% gross margin after trade spend. That's where we're trying to get to. We own our manufacturing and we built it out of necessity. Um, you know, when we were trying to make, when we were trying to scale this product at the beginning, um, the idea was, you know, to scale it. Our, you know, we went to 26 co-manufacturers and each one of them told us they can't produce this product. So we actually had to go build a factory and it took a long time. It took three years to build. It's all custom machinery. It's about 95% automated right now, 96% automated. Um, and it could support about you know, if we're pushing the three shifts, uh, it could support like 90,000 chocolate bars a day, which is about 70 million of output of revenue. We're not there yet. You know, year one, we did about a million in sales. Year two, we did about three, year three, nine. And then, you know, this year, 17, and then hopefully next year, 35, um, 30 to 35 million and uh yeah our fiscal year is may so that's how we calculate it it's okay from, makes sense may. i was going to ask whether it's 2023 or not okay so it makes yeah sense. so it's you're, may you're just 20, in this current yeah okay. may 23 hopefully we'll get to 17 and then may 24 be that 30 35 um okay. we have three four SKUs right now we're in about four thousand plus distribution points um across canada and the united states our turns are very high that's what we focus on is velocity depth um but from an operation standpoint it's, it's hard it's hard building a chalk company it's hard building a cpg company at scale getting the margins to where it is we burn you know, we're still a burning ton of money. We, we, we hope we will go into the black as of May this year. Um, mm-hmm. That's really the vision and the goal still. And yeah, man, like we want to grow between 50 to 100% year over year. That's that's the focus. And and uh, the goal in the next three years is get to 100 million in revenue with a 60% gross margin. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's the game that we're playing. Yeah, that revenue will get you to, to unicorn status quite easily. Um, and you'll be a target essentially for, for like a Herschel <laughs> eventually. Okay, mix, mix, mix a, mix a, mix a ton of sense, and, and then um, from a man, from from a headcount standpoint, where, where where are you at the moment? We're at 60, 60 team members, sixty amazing okay. folks that um, ha- are working their asses off. What's the split? Uh, it's from... it's mostly manufacturing. I'd say sixty percent manufacturing. Okay, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. And then you're all you're still based in Quebec. Yeah, Montreal, okay. Quebec. We have Montreal. some teammates in okay. Toronto and Texas, okay. Okay. Uh, Arizona, but uh, mostly in Montreal. You're doing Canada proud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and then from a, a marketing, st- so, so you're talking about like gross margins. When do you think you'd be able to hit the, the 60%, you know, gross? In a year, in a year and a half, hopefully. Okay. Okay. In- interesting. Interesting. And then um, from a, from, from a company structure standpoint, you, you did raise money. At what point did you, what was your capital raising journey like? Yeah. So we raised about, seven uh, i think it was 20 million now to date uh, usd and then mm-hmm. four million from debt from the government for the factory um mm-hmm. you know we we've raised um yeah we've raised i think in end of year one um end of year end of year three sorry end of year two and then beginning of year four okay and did you raise from from angels? Did you raise? Was it PE? Was it, it, was was ve- it VC? Venture funds have we've raised with venture funds to date, okay. um, and some operators. So in entrepreneurs and operators um, that have added value in the skill sets that we've needed them to add value. So I think mm-hmm. the fundraising journey has helped us. It's not been as difficult for us because we build out, we build publicly, so people see our journey and they can mm-hmm. trust us and they like it and they, they they already have a sense of who we are. And if they're interested, they'll reach out. So what's your valuation now? Our last, val- well, our last valuation was when we raised my last year was um, 35, US, 35 million USD pre-money. So with the 10 million mm-hmm. is about 45 post-money, 45 million USD post-money. Okay. Okay. And, and do you plan another further, further round? We plan on potentially taking this company public um, mm-hmm. in the Can- Toronto Stock Exchange. So Canada's, uh, you know, in Canada, that's the, the uh, an IPO um, mm-hmm. or private big private equity comes in and funds or a family office funds the long term of this journey. Again, we're not here to sell the company necessarily. We're mm-hmm. here to build it um, long term. We want to be a, a dominant chocolate, you know, a functional chocolate company in yeah. all of the world, not just Canada, United States. Um, so we have we have a vision of global expansion. And again, chocolate is chocolate snacking is one hundred and forty billion dollars um, mm-hmm. market cap. You know, it's huge. So there's room to play. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, why not think big? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then what does channel, what, what does your channel marketing look like? Um, you know, you're in what, to, what stores are you in? I, I mentioned a few, um, I'm sure you're, you're in a few more. 
We're in Target, uh, United States, Sprouts, Whole Foods, Wegmans. Um, in Canada, we're in Walmart, uh, Sobeys, Metro, and then all the ha- natural and health food stores. You know, half, mm-hmm. 30% of our business is D2C um, via our website and Amazon. 30%? And, uh, 70% wow. is retail. Wow. We're okay, located so in the refrigerated section, so it's a bit unique. Um, in terms of placement. So how do you do fulfillment with, um, with, with cold items? You just put them in like insulated packs with a reusable ice pack. And then, uh, with, uh, sometimes our, our retailers pick up refrigerated in their trucks. Okay. Hard boxing also. Okay. Okay. Makes, makes, makes a ton of sense. And then, um, from a channel expansion standpoint, do you lead that or do you have um, a a channel expert who, you know, who's, who's calling and knocking at the doors at, um, groceries? So we're still growing, and, and this year we're going to focus on on, on really continuing to win at Target and, and the larger retailers, um, while supporting obviously our independence. That's that those are our bread and butter in terms of brand building and and, and support. Um, but yeah, we're going to expand um, into the larger retailers, potentially Costco Canada, um, potentially Walmart United States by the end of the year. Um, we see the value once you understand those retailers. The volume is immensely it, it's mm-hmm. crazy, um, but you need to understand the logistics game of that, and you need to have brand awareness. And that's what we're just focusing on this year is building those the brand awareness up, mm-hmm. continuing to celebritize this brand um, to get the views and the the fans, and then getting the distribution along at the same time to support that. Um, because, mm-hmm. you know, you you want to have stores where people can go within five kilometers or five miles to get get any any midday square they want. Mm-hmm. 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 And um, do you do you think um, there'll be other sort of um, well characters coming into the story? further down the line if you really wanted to expand it so in terms of characters like from a storyline perspective yeah our teammates yeah. are definitely characters and they're they're going to develop mm-hmm. their stories as well throughout the journey um but from a new new product standpoint um we have four skews in this functional chocolate bar we'll probably go to about six in terms of flavor profiles after that after, well, we should be able to get to 100 million in revenue in, in the united states and canada um, and then we're going to expand globally, but at the, the same time, we're also going to innovate potentially on other functional chocolate snacks, like maybe cookies mm-hmm. or maybe um, ice. We're going to play in many. We're gonna, we want to be a chocolate company with sub categories. That being yeah. said, we want to be known as a tight skew count for our chocolate bars, our new versions of a chocolate bar. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And then um, what's what's your take on just on on channel marketing you know what's what's what, what is your take what, what what are the wins how, how can you know what what should people so what listeners really take away from from, from channel marketing what were your big ideas i like retail retail is a game if you understand it you can make a lot of dollars uh you just need to understand logistics be able to manage mm-hmm. your distributors and your brokers properly um once you have that intact the volumes are just are insane. I think D2C is necessary to have as a way to have as a channel, but mm-hmm. that's just for us, you know, shipping refrigerated chocolate. It's very expensive. Yep. It's for our loyal customers to buy bulk. And then also for some people that want discovery and convenience fast. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise it's just there as like a marketing tool. Yeah. Yeah. And um, do you deploy equity capital into, um, you know, paying invoices when I mean yep. invoices, I mean, um, I, I, I mean, for stock, or do you do you just finance that, you know, with debt, and and do you really use, you know, equity for for, for your market and for for your growth and your your, your opex? Equity is just for our raising money um, and stock options, but um, from a standpoint of all the funding, we we've been it's the money in the company that's doing it. Um, we do have a line of credit from one of our bank um, that helps, but. Um, yeah, we're looking for non-dilutive capital to support some of that working stuff that needs to keep going every day. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, we're, again, we go to the black as of April, which is super exciting, May, April this year. Um, mm-hmm. So that will hopefully generate more cash into the business. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, DSC actually drives cash flow up because it's paid in three days, right? So yep. um, we do kind of use that as a way to keep cash in the business as well. So it's like that. These are like the strategies that we're using. So, okay. um, yeah. Final question has got to do with like your DTC retention um, rate. So what, what kind of retentions are you seeing? Um, uh, uh, do they have like a save and subscribe option, for instance? They don't have a save subscribe option. We're, we're seeing a lot of the customers stay on for like two months on our website and then mm-hmm. go to retail to buy the product after that. They find it in their local retailers and they're like, okay, well, we don't need to buy necessarily two boxes at a time. We could buy, you know, four or five bars at a time at the retailer. And that's where they they fade off and they stay into the retailer, which is actually great for us because we want to be a stronger retail business anyways. Yeah. Amazing. 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 All right. Um, so this segment of the episode done right now, we're about to get into the evergreen rapid fire question section. So I'm going to ask you a few questions 
five, maybe seven questions. And if you could use a single answer to, to, yeah. to answer each of the questions, I really appreciate it, mate. Go ahead. What advice would you give yourself five years ago? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. All right. Are you a morning person? Yes. What's your daily morning routine like? Wake up at five. I typically go get a coffee. Then I read for about 30, for 30 45 minutes. Before getting injured, I would work out. And then I start my day at about 7.30. What two things can't you live without? Uh, books and and working out. Speaking of books, what book are you currently reading or listening to? Competing Against Luck. It's all about innovation. Amazing. I'll bookmark that. Finally, what's been your best mistake to date? By that, I mean a setback that's given you the biggest feedback. Trying to manage people. Um, for me, I tried to operate, be a be the CMO and manage people. That's not my skill. I learned that I learned that you play to your strengths, not your weaknesses. And a weakness of mine is is being that leader that manages. That's why I don't manage anybody in the company. Great stuff. Mr. Jake Carls, co-founder of Midday Squares. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the 2X e-commerce show. I've enjoyed this, this convo. Appreciate you dearly. Thanks for having me and giving me a voice. I love you. And thanks to everyone listening. Love you too. Appreciate the energy. Cheers.